I'm excited today to welcome the founders of Tavis to Quinn and Hassan, who just raised a 40 million Series B led by CRV. Tell us what Tavis does. We build AI humans. We're an AI research lab that focuses on teaching machines the art of how to be humans, so teaching them to see, hear, respond, act, even look like humans do. What does that look like? Can we take a look at a demo? Yeah, that'd be great. Here we're about to talk with Charlie, one of our awesome Tavis pals. And it's really cool because you know you can video call them, you can audio call them, you can text them even. They're always on, they're thinking about you, they're agentic. They look real, like a human. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they can see you, they can react to all your expressions, your emotions. They really feel like you're talking to a coworker or a friend rather than a machine. And I think the impressive stuff is that this is all running in real time. Yeah, absolutely. It's all running in real time. Let's actually see a very short clip of it interacting. Hey, what's up, Dom? Good morning, Hassan. How may I assist you today? Yeah, can you tell me what my schedule is like for today? Certainly, sir. You are currently scheduled for a YC recording of some sort, followed by a 2 p.m. product meeting and a 3.30 investor call. Great. My recording's running over. Can you draft a quick email saying I'll be 15 minutes late to the product meeting? Right away, sir. If you check your email, I've already prepared a message informing them of your delay. Beautiful, thanks. My pleasure, sir. Can I be of any other assistance today? Very cool, thank you. That's, that was a cool demo. So tell us a bit about who are some of your top customers? We have a pretty awesome, diverse set of customers, everything from like small startups to like Fortune 10 companies, uh, some of which are like Amazon, um, Better.com, Alibaba, that are using our interfaces and our models to build these really cool AI employees. What do these AI employees do? I think you mentioned you have three categories of types of applications? Yeah, so there's three big buckets that we really do a lot of work with. The first one is learning and development. So a lot of training, education, things like that. The second one is healthcare. So think patient intake, nutrition coaches, elderly companionship. And then the third bucket is go to market. So anything from an AI SDR to a AI solutions engineer to a customer support manager. So it's really across the board. I think that's been part of the fun of building it yeah. too. It's, it's amazing to see all of the really awesome AI human use cases that we're seeing um, people create. Like just the craziest thing that we would never have imagined. So it's basically a virtual human that's doing all these tasks over uh, video, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's an AI human on video, um, but with with the new updates, also you can, you can you can video call, you can audio call, you can text you. It's it feels like a coworker or a friend. And for that to be the case, it needs to actually feel human, right? It needs to look like you, sound like you, understand, interact, just like a human would. And and that's where you know it really really gets its its special touch. And there's a lot of custom use cases. So the way you guys work right now, you got to hear with being a SDK where customers like Amazon, Alibaba, take your SDK and build mm -hmm. the custom AI employee, right? Yeah. But that was not the case all the time, right? Yeah. I think when you guys went through the batch back in summer 21, this is uh, way before the chat GBT era, you were one of the OGs in AI before AI was a thing. Yeah. Tell us about that era. We like to say that we were doing AI before it was a cool thing to do back in 2020 and 2021. Yeah, I mean, when we were through YC, it was, um, there, was, there was not that much that you could do with the models of the time, right? And so we were, we were sort of limited by what we could create. And so at the time, the best that we could do with these generative models was do what we call like um, lip sync infill, which is like you could, uh, and we use it for AI personalized video. So basically you could record one video saying, hey Diana, saw you worked at YC and then you could send out thousands that were all personalized, lip synced with your, with your voice. So I'd say, hey there, Alex, saw you worked at X, Y, A, B, C, right? That was what you could do at the time. You could create personalized video because you could take a segment and, and really scale it up. Um, over time though, of course, the models have evolved and our research has evolved to be able to do a lot more. You guys stayed the course in this direction because before you were selling this tool to sales team mm -hmm. and then evolve into the SDK. Yeah. So tell us what was that pivotal moment? I mean, I think it was a few things. I think it was um, really understanding who we wanted to be as a company, right? I think that like after we did our Series A, there was like this uh, crucible moment where we're like, hey, are we going to be like an AI sales company? Or are we going to be focusing on developing these models for like, you know, for, like human computing, essentially, like to develop the next generation models for like 
human behavioral analysis and simulation. And we decided that, hey, like, we don't want to go down the path of being an AI sales company. That's not just not the DNA of our team. It's not who we are. And ultimately, we didn't really think that we, could, we personally could make a massive business with that. And so we decided to take the path of saying, hey, we're actually going to step back and we're going to go and focus on building the models and serving these as a next generation interface and as an API that you can consume and build on. I think a lot of it came back to our core too. I think you know, we went through the YC batch and it was, you know, we were pushing, we were trying to get as much momentum as possible and, and build, build, build. And we got a ton of customers that came to us looking for very specific things, which was awesome at the time. And then at the end of the summer, we took that step back and said, wait a sec, like, okay, these are, these are really cool customers to work with, but like, is this really who we are and what we want to be building? And Took that, took that really critical reflection and ultimately you know, made that jump into the API and SDK side. The impressive thing is having the courage to take that leap because you essentially, I remember having this conversation, you churn all those yeah. customers and you were on the track to get Series A traction before yeah. all that yeah. and you were growing quite quickly and to say that is not the path and our DNA are more extremely technical. You had some really impressive research work that you've done it was not to be a sales company and to be now what you are becoming an AI research lab, right? It took a lot and it was the right choice, yeah, evidently. Yeah, yeah. Because now you are building foundation models, not just for rendering, which was what it was before, and now also perception. Can you tell us about these two sides of the yin yeah. and yang? I mean, ultimately it came down to like, we saw a larger vision that we could really, we wanted to pursue. And I think a lot of the team has had this vision for a long time around, you know, machines that like meet us where we are. Yeah? Instead of us having to learn how machine talks, like they can meet us, and they can video call us, they like phone us, text us. And in order to do that, in order to teach machines like the art of, of like what this is, like this is like a dance, um, then just giving them the face isn't good enough. And also the, the face won't be good enough ever unless you teach a machine to see the way that we see and teach them like perception, contextual perception. So we, we both, it was both necessity to make the rendering models better, but also part of like, if we want to build these AI humans, then they have to be able to see our expressions, our gestures, because we speak as much through our face and what we don't say as we do through our words. And so we really focused a lot on trying to collect all these signals that otherwise weren't collected before, um, and then make meaning out of them. So teach the machines the relationship between what you said and how you said it and the expression on your face and like how that was a reaction to what I had said, right? Like all those things became you know, essential to building these AI humans. And I think a key thing is that this is only possible to be built now because for this to work, it needs the real low latency to yes. have a fast response time. I mean, the human perception is more than, what is it, 10 milliseconds? Yeah, yeah, I like, you know, and a great response back and forth happens in like less than 200 milliseconds. So you guys have some new product launches that are coming up. Can you tell us more about it? I mean, yeah, so for the past couple of years, we've been working on the foundational models to teach machines to see, hear, respond, even look like humans do. Um, and with this new product launch, we're actually, um, essentially bringing like AI humans to life for regular consumers and prosumers. And we really think it's like a transformative moment where like we feel like we've been in the command line era of AI. We're just like in early computing where we went from these like command line computers to GUIs that allowed millions of people to use machines. I think with what we're calling the Tavis Pals, it's going to be the same thing where you'll have this AI human um, that meets you where you are. It can video call you, it can text you, um, it can, you know, you can, it can, you can call it. It's proactive, it's multimodal, it's agentic, so it can go and do things for you. And it feels really, really natural because it has a high degree of emotional intelligence powered by these really amazing state-of-the-art perception models. That's pretty cool. This is a big evolution. You're going from serving very technical users with the SDK that need to be good software engineers to ship an AI human, now to someone who's not technical to be able to just launch it. And that's going to unlock a lot more interactions. I mean, if you guys, if you guys succeed with this, you're going to probably be doing at some point 100 billion yeah. Tavis interactions, right? Yeah, yeah. How will the world change when you get to when you get there? Yeah, I mean, I think our team will cry happy and sad tears. Um, but I think I think what we're really excited about is solving the human computing problem. Which, if you solve, then essentially, like using a computer becomes something that's like second nature. You don't have to learn how to do it. Uh, it just feels like talking to a friend or coworker. So you'll talk to your AI doctor or your AI therapist or your AI assistant sidekick. Everyone will have like Cortana and Jarvis like 
you know, like sci-fi dreamed of in their hands. It'll understand you immensely. And that's like a future we're really excited about. It's the start, right? It's the tip of the iceberg. These are the five first class citizens showing what AI humans can and, and should be. And then from there, we'll, we'll continue to expand where people can create their own and build on top of those. That's a very cool future where Tavos is going. And this is the other side of it where there might be a bit of um, concerns from people in mm -hmm. terms of alignment and a lot of these jobs that AI yeah. are going to start taking. How do you guys think about that? I would say that like, Certainly, some of that will happen. Uh, and I think at Tavis, like, we, we don't try to shy away from that and say, oh, we definitely, definitely won't be replacing the jobs. But I think that the, the key goal is not to replace humans, but to replace bad machines that have been already put in place and are causing a regression. Like, telehealth already exists. You already don't get to talk to a front desk receptionist or a nurse, and it's just a worse experience for everyone involved. If you have an AI intake assistant that really understands you, it sees you, it sees how you're feeling, and it spends time with you in your language, like that's a better experience. I also think that it's a little bit of a privileged approach to be able to say, hey, like, if you had asked me like two years ago about AI therapy, I would've been like, that's crazy, it's a bad idea. But the reality is like most people in the world can't afford therapy, they don't have access to it. And so the alternative isn't a human, it's nothing. Uh, and so if we can deliver a 80 to 90% good experience. It's not actually replacing a human, it's putting this AI human somewhere where there was no alternative. Um, and that's something that we find to be really special. So how do you actually build these AI humans that have empathy? That's a good question. It's interesting because like human conversation is incredibly nuanced. Um, we like to say at Tavis that human conversation is an art, it's a dance. Like this is a waltz that we're doing right now. And machines are in the corner doing the robot and we're trying to do a waltz. And so to, to bring machines uh, to be able to do the waltz, the first thing is you have to give them the right signal and be able to collect the right data. And so that's why we spent some time in perception, being able to collect the most nuanced data on that eyebrow twitch you had or the slight smile, uh, to be able to collect that data and then to be able to actually form understanding around it. Um, and the understanding piece and the relationship piece is actually really important. So teaching them the relationship between the eyebrow, the eyebrow twitch and what was said before that. Like what was that in response to? We spend a lot of time modeling those things. And essentially, you can summarize what we're doing as creating human simulation models. What we're doing, we're simulating human conversations and reactions and expressions. And it's a lot of fun and there's a, it's a very human thing to do. Uh, which is like always a little tough for research teams. Is like there's like the research angle is like very very human rooted. And a big part of what's important here too is how we bring it to the world. I think one of the lessons we learned really really early on was we need an amazing demo that shows someone the magic, the experience, yeah. because we've you know adjusted to how we talk to machines for so long, right? We type instead of talk, right? We have all of these lossy mechanisms for how we change information and we're almost having to reteach humans how they can communicate with machines, how they can actually talk naturally and normally. So it's not just the models, but it's actually creating the experience around it where people are able to have this you know, really refreshing, this new experience of, of talking to a machine. Yeah, 100%. What kind of advice would you have for founders that are just getting started? Have more conviction in, uh, in yourself and in the vision. Whenever you're a young founder, you can be more easily swayed <laughs> by, by, uh, by opinions and, and, and feeling like you need to do you know, you need to follow a certain path. And I think it took us a bit to figure out what we believed in is what we should be working on. In particular was that crucible moment, because yeah. I remember that was a pretty big pivot for your company and it took a bit of time for you to come and to your own belief. Yeah. Because you had a bunch of other people telling you otherwise, right? Yes, absolutely. And it was a struggle. Yeah, yeah. it was. It, it felt like it felt like you might let someone else down and ultimately like this is a company that you're building and you have to have full belief that the work that you're doing is a form of love. If you don't have that, then it's not gonna be successful no matter what. It, it's a craft. I, I think that was probably actually one of the most difficult times at Tavis, looking back at yeah. it, when we let those opinions influence us, yeah. right? I think it impacted who we hired, what we were building, who we worked with. Like it, it went throughout the business. It wasn't even just about the direction. Yeah. One of the learnings was definitely about not even believe in ourselves, but just have a deep conviction in what we're doing and let that flow everywhere throughout the business. But the other one is the only thing that matters is momentum. Mm. Like if, if things are not moving, then the business isn't moving. And, and it's in the small things, it's in the big things. But the only thing that matters is every day something needs to happen. Right? And I think driving that through and pushing that through is, is one of the few things that has yeah. kept mm -hmm. things moving forward day over day. 100%. I think that's a good way to end. I think we talked about in one of the videos recently that the 
first mo startup really only have is just speed. Yeah. And you guys done it. Our take on it is we are six months ahead, and we need to keep moving as, as fast as we can to keep that up. We have a we have a, our core motto at Moto at Tavis is faster, faster until the thrill of speed overcomes the fear of death. <laughs> okay. And has worked really well for us so far. Faster, faster. Faster, faster. faster. All right, guys, congratulations. Thank you. On the Thanks for having, having us. us. Thank you for coming.